네, 지금 내부의 귀빈들께서 입장하고 계십니다. The delegates and guests are now entering the event hall. Welcome. 네, 지금 지식 재산과 메타버스 국제 프로그램 주요 내부 분들 입장하고 계십니다. The participants and guests and delegates for the Global Forum on IP and Metaverse are entering the hall. 네, 여러분 안녕하십니까? Good morning. I am your MC for the Global Forum on IP Metaverse. I am the announcer Song Kyu Ah. Thank you for taking time out of your schedules to join us today at the Global Forum on IP and Metaverse. Before we begin the event, we must remember the tragedy that took place last Saturday in Itaewon. With wishes that the disease will rest in peace, we will have a short moment of silence. I kindly ask everyone to please stand up. A moment of silence. Thank you. Please take your seats. Today's event begins with some opening remarks by Dr. Chu Yong Chang, Vice Minister for Science, Technology, and Innovation of the Ministry of Science and ICT. And then we will listen to congratulatory remarks from Director General Darren Tang of WIPO and Kim Young Shik, lawmaker. Then we will have a keynote a speech and sessions one, two, three, and panel discussion. First, I would like to invite Dr. Chu Yong Chang, Vice Minister for Science, Technology, and Innovation of the Ministry of Science and ICT. Because we are in national mourning, please refrain from applauding as he takes the stage. I would like to invite Vice Minister Chu Yong Chang for Science, Technology, and Innovation of the Ministry of Science and ICT. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Yong Chang Ju. I'm the Vice Minister for Science, Technology, Science, Technology and Innovation uh, from the Ministry of Science and ICT. Before I begin, I'd like to express my deepest condolences to the victims of the tragedy in Itaewon on the October 29th. Uh, let me just begin by expanding my gratitude to the organizers at the Presidential Council on Intellectual Property, Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism, and the Korean Intellectual Property Office, and many IP experts for preparing this event despite the difficult circumstances. I'd also like to thank uh, Mr. Darren Tang, the Director General of the WIPO, for sending his congratulatory remarks on video. We are currently living in a time when digitalization transcends the realm of technology, enabling innovation in politics, economy, society, and culture under 
the grandiose digital transition. And at the center of this era is a new digital continent that is referred to as a metaverse, where the virtual and real worlds meet and converge. The metaverse will be a natural part of our daily lives that crosses over the two worlds based on innovative technology that turn all of our imagination into reality. The metaverse is a world of completely new experiences and it's expected to create unlimited opportunities and economic value. And so major countries and big techs are engaged in competition to strengthen their competitiveness by developing new technology and expanding investment. However, the metaverse is still an evolving industry and will inevitably experience issues that we've never faced before. The field of intellectual property, like industrial property, copyright, that uphold the metaverse ecosystem is no exception. Uh, diverse array of IP-related issues have been arising. So copying well-known trademarks in the real world in the metaverse and the issue of who is attributable to the works produced by avatars and IP infringement taking place in the metaverse have no borders and these are some examples of the issues that we face. So to find a balance between the fair use of intellectual property and protection of creators' rights and to build a sustainable and trusted metaverse ecosystem system, global coordination is highly essential. So the Presidential Council on Intellectual Property has organized this forum in this regard as a chance to discuss these issues and contribute to the policy making look going forward. I'm sure that the today's forum will serve as a venue to listen to experts on the various examples, case studies, and the latest trends of different countries and for us to gather our wisdom. Recently, the Korean government announced the Korean digital strategy, and it reflects our vision to lead the world in the digital innovation. The metaverse roadmap will be established and also implemented as part of this strategy. Let, last but not least, let me close by thanking the organizers for your hard work and wishing the health and happiness of all participants. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those remarks, Vice Minister Ju Yong Chang. With the development of Metaverse, the significance of IP has become much more meaningful, according to his remarks. Now we would like to listen to some congratulatory remarks from the Director General of WIPO, Mr. Darren Tang. Because he wasn't able to join us today in person, he will be greeting us on screen. Vice Minister for Science, Technology and Innovation at the Ministry of Science and ICT. Distinguished delegates, it is an honor to help open this global forum on IP and the metaverse. I'd like to thank the Presidential Council on IP, the Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism, and the Korean Intellectual Property Office for inviting me to participate in this event. On behalf of everyone at WIPO, I'd like to also extend my deepest condolences to all those affected by the recent terrible tragedy that took place in Seoul. Our hearts go out to those who lost a loved one, and we wish those who are injured a full and fast recovery. In this time of grief and national mourning, our thoughts and sympathies are with our Korean colleagues and friends. And ladies and gentlemen, the metaverse began life in science fiction, and it was the author, Neil Stevenson, who coined the term in his novel, Snow Crash, exactly 30 years ago. Since then, the ways in which we live, work and play have changed significantly. In today's world, the creativity of science fiction and the new horizons opened up by frontier technologies seem to be converging. Therefore, it is fitting that the metaverse is moving beyond the page. In the first five months of the year, more than $120 US billion was poured into the metaverse. That's more than double the total investments the year before 2021. And in this fast-moving environment, the Republic of Korea is recognized as a metaverse pioneer. WIPO is following with interest how authorities in Seoul are building a metaverse platform that will enable citizens to access public services virtually. The Digital New Deal 2.0 program, launched by the Ministry of Science and ICT, promises to add momentum to the domestic metaverse industry. And young artists such as ESPA are taking the metaverse and using the metaverse to find new ways of engaging with their fans. If any one word 
is most commonly associated with the metaverse it is potential. This reflects both the scale of the opportunities at play and the fact that its final form is still to emerge. But what we know for sure is that given the key role of innovators and creators in shaping this process and shaping the emergence of the metaverse, IP and the metaverse will be closely linked. IP rights are of course essential to the protection of virtual goods and consumers, but IP also helps to incentivize investments into the metaverse and provides the basis for cooperation and licensing agreements that are necessary for a single harmonized metaverse to emerge. And IP is a mechanism through which artists, designers, and app developers and others will make a living from the virtual world. But beyond this, the various players involved in constructing the metaverse need clear and transparent rules, as well as legal certainty if they are to operate successfully. It should come as no surprise that even in its infancy, the metaverse has given rise to legal and IP issues as questions of IP enforcement and jurisdiction play out in the virtual world. Against this backdrop, today's forum is an important opportunity to share perspectives and reflect on how this area is developing. Various IP officers have already updated their guidelines to better accommodate uh, these developments. This includes the Korean IP office, who introduced new trademark guidelines on the examination of virtual goods just in July. The global nature of the metaverse is decentralized and open system and the possibility of parallel metaverses will spark further IP issues and debate. WIPO will act as a neutral, professional and global forum for the discussion of emerging IP issues through these developments. And this includes our influential series of conversations on IP and frontier technology, which I extend an open invitation for you to join. So Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the rise of the metaverse is well captured by the fact that just last year, the same Neil Stevenson who invented the term founded his own metaverse-focused company, so it's becoming reality. In a world where authors are becoming innovators and innovators are building creative new worlds, IP will take on an even greater importance. At WIPO, we look forward to continuing our work together in the years ahead and please to ex accept our best wishes for a successful event. Kamsahamida. 네, 다렌탕 사무총장님의 Thank you very much, Director General 다렌탕. We will refrain from applauding. 네, 이 세... So now we have heard from uh, Mr. Darren Tang, and he has talked about the significance of the forum regarding the IP and metaverse. And he has also said, 감사합니다 in Korean. Thank you so much. Now I'm going to now invite uh, Mr. Yongshik Kim. He is a member of the National Assembly, but he has sent us a video for not being here. Good morning. I am Yong Shi Kim, representing Gumi City of the Gyeongbuk province. The development of online services has led our bodies to exist in the real world, but all of our attention and focus to face the digital world. So this has become our daily life. We are now witnessing a rapid transition to the next generation digital world, such as the Metaverse 3.0, leading to a heated competition over opportunities provided by this new continent. According to the global consultancy, McKinsey, the metaverse market is expected to grow hugely to surpass 1.5 trillion US dollars or 180 billion Korean won by the year 2030. And the United States, with its many innovative tech companies such as Google, Microsoft and Meta, is leading this market. And as you know, the U.S. has laws and institutions that prioritize individual liberty and creative expression. But those in Korea cannot be said to have the competitiveness necessary to vitalize the new metaverse-related industries. Korea's existing laws and regulations were legislated during a time when the state was effectively controlling traditional industries and the government was driving economic growth. And so under these circumstances, it's difficult to expect a vibrant metaverse industry based on freedom and creativity. And in order to overcome this situation, I led the proposition of a bill to promote the metaverse industry at the National Assembly, the first of such attempts in Korea. There are no borders in the metaverse world, and because the laws of a particular jurisdiction do not apply, cooperation and coordination among nations are very important, which is why I believe that today's forum is very meaningful because it provides a platform for 
cross-border collaboration. So I would like to thank everyone, uh, particularly at the Presidential Council on Intellectual Property, Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism, and the Korea Intellectual Property Office for providing us with this opportunity. And I would like to thank everyone, and I would like to uh, wish success and happiness for all the participants here today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we have heard from uh, Mr. Uh, Yong Shik Kim, member of the National Assembly, and uh, he has emphasized the importance of the metaverse industry. We are now going to go on to the keynote speech. We would like to now invite Professor Sang Yun Kim, a professor of the Kyung University, who is going to give us a keynote speech about economic activities and intellectual property in metaverse. Good morning. As was introduced, my name is Sang Yun Kim. I'm a cognitive scientist at the Kyung University. Yes, uh, we were asked to refrain from applauding. Anyway, I am researching metaverse, and during the tea time this morning, um, there were many people who asked me, what kind of metaverse are you looking into? So I am a cognitive scientist, and I look into the minds of people, and I look at how the minds of people are realized or articulated in a virtual world world. So I've been participating in a variety of different projects with this in mind. So so just to elaborate on what I'm doing, so um, there's going to be a CES uh, exposition in Las Vegas and a project that I participated in will be showcased and so there's going to be a um, entertainment uh, program and there are various metaverse devices that I am participating in developing which will also be showcased. There are also various metaverse platforms and forums that are taking place across uh, the world. So despite participating in a variety of different projects, I am not a legal expert. So I'm not going to be talking about about law in my presentation today, but mainly about the projects that I've been participating. So I'll be looking at the law from a practitioner's perspective to perhaps give some ideas about ways forward. So in the beginning of this year, I got a gift, a present from my student. Um, this student gave me some land. So I'm not a civil servant, so I'm not supposed to be giving uh, or receiving gifts. And But the reason that it was not problematic was because it's a virtual land. Anyway, um, the people who actually managed the land and created the land are people in their 20s. And so a student of mine, a university student, uh, gave me a print version of the land certificate. Probably because I'm older than them, they thought that I needed something on paper, not just virtually. So this is like a campaign, a nationwide campaign that is taking place around the country. So it's quite popular among university students. So let's look at exactly what is happening in this virtual world. So they have a land that's about half the area of the Seoul metropolitan city. So let's look at what kind of lives the students are leading in this world. So I looked what they were do doing and you can have um, you can go shopping. So there's like a, a mall where students uh, perform a variety of different activities, economic activities. So they go shopping and then they make this. Uh, so perhaps you were not able to see what was said in the building, but it's actually a church. And so you see these avatars in the metaverse and they are actually participating in religious activities in a church. What I thought was really surprising was this particular area. So what do you think this is? Uh, maybe the international participants will not be very familiar. It's actually a very Korean culture. So it's actually a mountain. So this is actually a, a graveyard in Korea. And graveyards in Korea are usually um, made on a hillside. So why do we have this kind of grade yards and these areas. So for our university students, it's not just a place for performances and shopping, but it's about everyday life. So within this digital world, they are actually creating a variety of different institutions. 
But then there are also property rights violations. There can also violence inflicted on others. And so what they thought was that they would have to introduce the death penalty for any criminal activities that take place in the metaverse. And so the avatars who have taken place, uh, who have participated in criminal activities will be executed and then buried in this graveyard. So it may just seem fun, but the students and the avatars are actually discussing very philosophical and religious issues even in the metaverse. So all different religions have their own uh, philosophy, but the afterlife always exists. And so they are discussing issues like whether the rights should be revived after a certain period of after the death, considering the afterlife, issues like that. And so uh, they also have currencies in the metaverse, and the circulation is quite uh, particular because it's very, very transparent. Even in a communist world, this level of transparency would not be possible. But in the metaverse, the students or the avatars are circulating their currency in a very transparent way. And they're also transacting of various resources that are extracted from the ground. And so they are now uh, trading commodities. And you also have a uh, commodity price index being created in the metaverse. So once again, uh, you can see that there are similarities between the real world and the uh, virtual world. So resources like diamond and gold are traded for very high prices, whereas other resources are uh, traded at lower prices. And then there are some people who do broadcasting. So they created a radio broadcast in the metaverse. And the interesting thing is, is that the platforms have become really popular among the youth. And so, you know, you have the um, terrestrial real world broadcasters like NBC and KBS. So they are the actual existing terrestrial broadcasters. And they are actually contacting the students saying that let's do a collaboration. And so let so what happened was that you have these um, broadcasting experts who would join hands with the students to actually broadcast radio programs in the metaverse, but also in the real world at the same time. So these kind of collaborative projects are actually taking place. So then the question came into my mind. So you would have music in the radio programs. What happens to the copyright? Who's managing the copyright or processing the copyright? I'm not quite sure, but I asked the students and the radio DJs who are involved, but they would explain that there is a certain process for processing copyright. But anyway, um, for now, I think that a lot of the metaverse programs will not be processing copyright properly. There are also really big projects taking place in the metaverse. So this is a map in the middle you see here. So you see the Han River and then you have this Seoul City. Well, it looks like Seoul City, uh, but then then you have these uh, orange and yellow lines. And so these are actually subway. So because there are, it's very highly populated and it's a large city in the metaverse, somebody actually uh, created a subway. So what happened was that uh, the rights to a land will be assigned and the rights to property will also be uh, collected. And then the railway or the subway tracks will be built and then people will be able to use the subway after paying. And the money that has been paid as a fare would then give them back as a return on investment to the investors. So. In the real world, you have these mass transit and uh, actually this kind of economic activity and investing in a mass transit and other infrastructure is being translated similarly into the metaverse. So these kind of economic activities are also taking place in the metaverse. So if I gave you around 70 to 80 pyong of land to you, what would you do with that land? So I'm not trying to test your imaginativeness, imagination, or your creativity. I'm showing you this example for these reasons. Within the metaverse, there are issues of ownership and rights of the individual. But what we are looking at now is still at this stage. 
the hardware that is needed, the core technology for the hardware and software that is needed for operating the metaverse, and whether the rights that were existing in the physical world, whether they can be transferred to the metaverse, the logos and the trademarks of famous companies. We're focusing on those issues, but there are many issues that might arise that it currently exist within the metaverse world, because there might be a voluntary economic ecosystem that is arising within the metaverse, which will lead to more issues regarding uh, rights and uh, ownership. For example, if I want to build a school within the metaverse, I might use the Kyung University logo and have an MBA course using similar building designs as those of Kyung University. But of course, there would be some uh, controversy at the real Kyung University. So what we are doing within the metaverse will lead to an equivalent amount of problems that will arise from the metaverse. So on an economic standpoint, we are moving to an uh, immersive economy. We were from the uh, manufacturing-based uh, industrial economy. We have moved to a service-based economy. And service-based economy was based in the physical world, but now services are being provided in the digital uh, space. And we are moving through the experience economy to the immersive economy of digital reality. So hardware and software and the content rights that become issues within the physical world are going to become issues in the digital world as well. And in addition, the data or right-related issues might arise additionally. So one example is what is going to be discussed and what is going to be seen and which routes the users take within the metaverse. All of that information and data would be uh, profiled and built into databases and who will have ownership of that data. So currently, we are concerned about copying the design of a building or infringement of intellectual property of owners in the physical world. But when we move into this gigantic digital universe, there will be new creations that did not exist in the physical world. And one complicated problem is that there are a lot of digital products and virtual products that have already been created, but they are not being used yet. So currently, they might not be leading to any issues, but further down the road, there is potential for them to uh, lead to more concerns and problems. And I saw the following circumstances. The products or buildings in the physical world, a lot of people are making representations of them in the digital world. But we see vice the reverse situation as well. The digital products or the buildings are being made into physical products using 3D printers. And if we look at the situation, we see that the rights of the original creator are not being protected at all. So to take a more economic standpoint, in 2007, I read the, the following article. So this was 15 years ago. But I thought that from an economic standpoint, this article was very much representative of the issues that we have to be concerned about. So Metaverse is otherwise known as Web 3.0. So it's hard to dry, hard to draw this clear lines, but in Korea we seem to use the word metaverse a lot, while in North America they seem to use the term web 3.0 a little more. So the scope of the definitions of those words, it's hard to distinguish that, but we might look as frames of reference at web 1.0 and web 2.0 and 3.0. In Web 2.0, we had the concept of unpaid labor. So I would like to take the example of the entertainment industry, which I collaborate with a lot. So Korean TV drama series and movies and music are very 
uh, well received across the world. So this year, a hit drama was extraordinary attorney Wu Young Woo. But we found that Southeast Asian nations were watching the drama series even before the streaming had been uh, finished in Korea. And we could see that some users would provide commentary and uh, explanations and descriptions of Korean culture while they uh, described the drama scenes. Of course, this is copyright infringement, but at the same time, they are working as sort of ambassadors to promote the drama overseas. So entertainment industry uses this term. Those kinds of fans are unpaid labor fandom members. So the fans are doing this voluntarily because they want to. And we didn't raise issue with their infringement of our copyright. So that was a balance that was struck. But I don't believe that this is a fair and equitable situation because they are playing the role of ambassadors for our content and culture, but they are not being compensated for that. They might, uh, of course, they might add to the value of the uh, original content by adding to secondary and tertiary uh, creation, but they are not being compensated for that. So across all industries, including the entertainment industry, I believe that people are continuing to take this viewpoint. In the metaverse, in the digital world, everyone can become an owner of content. So people who are used to the Web 2.0 world have the following misunderstanding. I have been a game player for Lineage over 10 years. I have a giant castle in the Lineage world, and I spent a lot of money in the Lineage world, and all of that is my property. But at the end of the day, that is not true. The game ecosystem and the multiverse, a mega, metaverse ecosystem might be technologically similar, but in terms of rights, in the game world, the users had very limited rights, despite of all of the time and resources they had invested in that world. But the users are now understanding that they have been on an unlevel playing field. They are looking more about, they're interested more about right to use to right to ownership. And I believe that this is going to be a very important uh, perception change of the public in Web 3.0H. So I'm not quite sure what kind of tone I should take because we are in a period of mourning. I would like to share what I have been done. And I said earlier that I'm involved in a broadcasting content production. To look at that in more detail, in our team, to look at the broadcasting content that we are, are producing, we are reviving the artists who have already passed away into digital avatars, and we are trying to prepare performances where they would collaborate with uh, current artists that are alive. And people are asking a lot about the uh, legal issues on who has allowed us to do that. And in terms of morals, whether this is a right decision to make. Only a few years ago, this kind of debate did not take place. But with the evolution of technology and opening up of digital worlds, we see that we have to quickly come to terms with these new emerging issues. So six, a BC 600, around that time, Parmadas said a very famous philosophical dictum, nothing comes from nothing. And I believe my own experience says the same. So 1.5 readers have went through my book titled Metaverse. I often got the question whether where the source of my uh, book, the resources, the works cited were clearly uh, stated. And in my second book, I was much more careful about uh, sorting the sites, citing, citing the source. 
sources. And the new generation is more used to these ch changes. To look at one very popular platform, we can see that a lot of users are uh, creating 100 percent identical uh, copies and counterfeit products, and because they are not being filtered or screened out, they are being sold on that platform. And the policies and internal regulations within businesses are not yet clearly defined, and I also see that the national level regulations and government controls are still not uh, detailed enough. Now about the potential and the future of the metaverse is sometimes exciting and sometimes scary. I had a recent interview this year. I interviewed some uh, business uh, owners within the Roblox, and I would like to share one episode that I heard from them. So one person hired about 200 people on Roblox, and they were communicating on a channel called Discord. So this person's biggest success of last year was the following. Last year, we had the Netflix hit drama, Squid Game, and this person saw Squid Game and was hit with an idea that this, he could make this into a giant uh, enterprise. So he went on Discord uh, channel and uh, suggested that they should work for 10 days to build and design Squid Game characters and content on Roblox. So games and content and characters were uh, formed on Roblox. You can see the uh, red clothing guards and the uh, players in green suits, and then there would be the tug of war place and whatnot. And so this was a very big success. So only 20 people came together over the course of 10 days to provide this service, and 4 million people ended up playing it. So a lot of Robux were paid, of course. So this was much a profit-building enterprise. So this leader was uh, very proud about his achievement, and he made around 200 billion won over one month and a half. And because the taxation status is not quite clear, uh, he wasn't even paying tax. So his demographics, he's 13, he's Korean, he's a sixth grader. So this amazing enterprise brought together 20 people from 10 countries around the world. But there was no understanding of the concepts of copyright or red pro right protection. I asked him whether he, he doesn't have any qualms towards Netflix, and he gave me a surprising answer. No, I'm not sorry at all, because I've promoted uh, Squid Game so very much through my enterprise. And so they should be paying me was what his uh, idea was. So the entertainment industry earlier told me that this is uh, unpaid la labor that the fans are providing. But I tried to, of course, persuade the boy that that's not the situation. We have to look at the law. Now, I talked to the Netflix people about this. They said that we should have gone first. And I asked them, so what are you going to do about it? And they did a test run of the game, and this is what they say. So we have to do product placement advertising in there. Because when young people are building content, Netflix content, when they are replicating Netflix content within Roblox, they don't have any commercial motive. But Netflix is looking, is looking at it from a different angle. They would think of adding Nike logos, of Adidas logos on the uh, content that is created within Roblox. So this is a space for new advertisement profits. So in the past, when we're thinking of economic agents, we usually thought about people in their mid to late 20s using their own knowledge and experience and abiding by the existing rules. But when we look at this metaverse world, the users are very young and they are not thinking about what is right or wrong and they are taking a really uh, enterprising 
uh, attempts that we could have never uh, imagined. Of course, I believe a lot of people here are interested in the legal and institutional uh, perspective. But I, after interviewing this boy, I thought that, of course, legislation is going to be very important, but at the same time, we should give a lot of opportunities for the younger generation to have an understanding of what is at stake in terms of uh, law before they make on any uh, mistakes while uh, unintentional mistakes while they are creating this and that in this new world. So there might be changes on four fronts. There is going to be hundreds of thousands of more IP that is created. And at the same time, there will be a wider diversity of IP types. I am not a legal expert, but when I'm applying for patents regarding a metaverse, when I talk with patent attorneys, they give me a lot of information. And I believe that we will see a lot more diverse types of IP emerging. And tracking of breaches is going to be very complex because not all digital products are going to be based on NFT. NFT makes them trackable, but those that are not based on NFT are going to be very difficult to track to see where breaches took place because most of the time they are working on the idea of open source. So it's hard to find out where their technology first was initiated. So if a person has an issue, how much damage this person has made is also going to be difficult to determine. And lastly, there's the issue of jurisdiction. I believe that jurisdiction will be uh, discussed by experts. So to look at some businesses that I am uh, pursuing, when we work with overseas offices, sometimes there's a lot of regulations and restrictions placed on uh, Korea if we're trying to operate on Korean Seoul. So that's why we host this overseas. Then the question is whether Koreans cannot join that business. No, they have, well, they can, but they have to go through a different uh, VPN. Uh, this is not going to be a legal problem, but anyway, they have to go into a, go through a roundabout way using VPN. So this is my definition of the metaverse. Metaverse is a world of creativity that transcends limits. Then what limits are, am I talking about? the biological person's limitations. They would have physical capacities and mental capacities, and this is all transcended by the possibilities of metaphors. And also the limitations of the physical world that human beings occupied are being transcended by the metaverse. So in a case that I saw in Japan last year, which is still ongoing, the Family Mart uh, convenience store chain in Japan, because it was difficult to find people who would be willing to work in the nighttime, they would have robots to uh, rearrange the products on the on the shelves and work the convenience stores at night. And about 8,000 convenience stores across Japan will have robots working at night. So. If there is an error in the robot's uh, software, then a person would go into a, a VR um, getup and then control the robots to remedy the error. So when we're thinking about the digital world, we look at not the physical world, but, and we seem to focus only on a world that is somewhere within the computer that is completely uh, segregated from the physical world. However, metaverse and the digital world is going to be even closely linked and interconnected with the physical world. And the younger generation who are digital natives are going to be much more engaged with the metaverse. So we have to take close attention, have close attention over the new use cases. 
So as I accepted the to be the keynote speaker, because I'm a legal expert, I was trying to provide a still insightful uh, presentation. So how metaverse is going to change how people live, and in particular, I believe that the younger generation will be shaping the future of metaverse, especially those in their uh, teens and 20s and 30s. What kind of challenges they're taking up and what kind of concerns might arise from their uh, challenges was the focus of my presentation. The legal issues and perspectives will be discussed in detail, I believe, by the other experts that are present in the other sessions. And with that, I would like to close here my presentation. Thank you for uh, your attention.